The term weekend warrior first entered the English lexicon back in 1981. It was coined to describe the kind of people who typically hold a desk job from Monday to Friday, but dream about the adventures they will have when the work week is done. Weekend warriors look forward to leaving behind the confines of suburban life to head out into the wilds of nature and the unknown. Well, at least some of the unknown. Weekend warriors, like all travelers, know their starting point and ending point. After all, they have to make sure they get back home in time to start the work week again on Monday. Rather, for them, it's, it's what lies in between that represents the unknown. Now, I have to admit that my travels tend to take a different form than striking out on an unfamiliar trail through the woods. And most of my trips involve airports and airlines. I typically start from my home in San Antonio. I pack my clothes in my usual bag. I drop it into the trunk of my car. I drive my regular route to the airport and off I go. And even when I start my journey from another place, I always know where I am at that particular moment in time. I begin from a place of certainty. In the same way, I always know where I will end up. Even if I've never been to my final destination before, I know where I'm going, when I'm going to arrive, and who will meet me when I get there. I've got an itinerary in place that helps me stay grounded even when I don't know the ground. But what I rarely know is what will happen in the middle. Will there be an accident on the freeway that backs up traffic? Or will my flight be on time? Who will I sit next to when I do get on the plane? Will I encounter turbulence in the air? Will the flight attendants bring peanuts or cookies? These are questions I can't answer until I actually get on the move. Well, strange as it may sound, the same can be said of followers of Christ. We all know where we started our trip. The book of Genesis says, our journey began when God created Adam and Eve. And we all know where we will end up. The book of Revelation says our home will be with Jesus in the new Jerusalem. But there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen in between, a lot of questions and confusion about the days we are living in right now as we move toward our final destination. So wouldn't it be helpful if we could know what happens next? Well, thankfully, we can. We can know what happens next because God has given us an itinerary in the pages of his word. And much of that itinerary points back to the past, what we call biblical history. But there are elements of that itinerary that point forward to our future, and we call that biblical prophecy. Now, people tend to think of biblical prophecy as something that points toward the end of all things. And this makes sense since we typically refer to what will happen using terms such as end times or the end of history. But as we will see in this study, there is actually no end when it comes to history. There's no expiration date for humanity. There will be no true end for your life or my life. Instead, we're all moving toward a new beginning called eternity. For that reason, it's appropriate for us to begin this study at the old beginning, or maybe I should say the first beginning. I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. We read about this incredible place in the opening pages of the Bible. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Shortly after, we learn that God placed the first human beings there to reign. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. 
Another translation says that human beings were created to have dominion over these things. But this begs an important question. Are we reigning now? Do we oversee the sea, rule over the livestock, have dominion over creation? Far from it. I mean, we can hardly get fish to bite, much less obey. And some animals would sooner eat us than submit to us. I think we can all agree with the New Testament writer who observed, when God put Adam and Eve in charge of everything, nothing was excluded, but we don't see it yet. Don't see everything under human jurisdiction. Indeed, we don't. Instead of ruling the world, we feel ruled by the world. We see creation in a state of corruption and confusion. There are heat waves and wildfires and hurricanes and earthquakes and famines. Something is awry. What happened? Well, the answer is simple. Sin happened. A villain infiltrated Eden and this crafty serpent convinced Adam and Eve that the garden, in all its resplendence and abundance, was not enough. No, the serpent said what they needed was to be like God. All they had to do was eat the fruit of the tree that had been forbidden to them, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, Adam and Eve bought the lie, and they decided that they did, in fact, want to be like God. And God, who knows what is best for his creation, said no. As a result, the Lord temporarily suspended his Garden of Eden plan, but he did not cancel it or forever abandon it, and he certainly did not abandon us. He did just the opposite. He set in motion a plan of redemption that included promises and prophets and miracles. This plan ultimately led to Jesus entering our world as a flesh and blood human being. You know, scripture calls him the last Adam. The two had very much in common. Like Adam, Jesus had no earthly father. Like Adam, Jesus was given authority over creation. Like Adam, Jesus was tempted. But unlike Adam, Jesus did not sin. Instead, he succeeded where Adam failed and became our savior. God's dream has never changed. He still wants us to reign with him. He is still planning for us to reign with him. And we see this in the book of Revelation, where we find this invitation from Christ. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Yes, God's storyline concludes with you, me, and all his children living, ruling, dining, and serving with him in a perfect world. Again, we see this revealed in the book of Revelation, where these words are said of Jesus, you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. The final stop in our heavenly itinerary involves not just a renewal of Eden, but also a position of authority in that future garden. We will reign with God. Does it surprise you to hear those words? Well, if so, you're not alone. It surprised Paul's readers in the early church, and he was surprised that they were surprised. He wrote, do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? 
Do you not know that we will judge angels? Our authority in eternity is no small matter in Scripture. The theme of our reign is introduced in the first chapters of the first book, confirmed in the final chapter of the final book, and discussed by many others in between, including Jesus himself. No matter what else occurs in the next phase of history, our Savior will share his dominion with you and me. This promise is part of God's redemptive plan. Actually, God has given us more than just a promise. He has also provided us with a number of critical covenants. Jesus didn't just put his life on the line. He also signed his name on the dotted line for our benefit. And these covenants in Scripture create a divine trajectory for human history. They set boundaries for the past, support us in the present, and offer us hope for the future. Now, we've already covered one of these, God's covenant with Adam and Eve. God promised dominion to the first couple and instructed them to fill the earth and subdue it. Of course, Adam and Eve didn't follow through on their end of the bargain, but their failure did not cause God to change his mind or abandon his covenant. No, God's Edenic covenant is still leading us to a time in which God's perfected children will reign over a perfect earth. And we will someday declare the words that Jeremiah wrote, the Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. Another critical covenant is the one God made with Abraham. Two words summarize this agreement, seed and soil. We read about the seed portion of the covenant in Genesis 12, one through three. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, God would fulfill this promise by making Israel into a great nation. And he would bless the world through the seed of Abraham. Because of that seed, we have the prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. We have King David and his Psalms. We have Jerusalem and its history. But greatest by far, we have the Savior, Jesus Christ. We have his word, his church, and the blessed hope of his return. God kept the seed promise. So we can expect him to keep the soil promise as well. We read about that part of the promise in Genesis 15, 18 through 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Israel is the only nation in history to whom God has given land. And the promise came with clear geographical boundaries. It encompassed all the land from the Mediterranean Sea on the western border of the Euphrates River on the east. The northern boundary extended 100 miles north of Damascus and the southern boundary about 100 miles south of Jerusalem. The soil covenant today includes modern day Israel, as well as parts of Egypt and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. God has not completely fulfilled this covenant. Israel expanded its territory under the rule of David and Solomon, but the borders never matched what God promised. So this promise is yet to be fulfilled. Next, 
is God's covenant with David. As we read in 2 Samuel 7 and verse 16, God said, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. God was declaring that someone from David's house would sit on his throne and rule over his kingdom forever. About a thousand years later, the angel Gabriel quoted this covenant to Mary, saying, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. For this to happen, Israel must exist as a nation, which it does, David's descendant must be alive, which he is. Jesus Christ must then return to earth, which he will. And he must bodily and literally sit on David's throne and reign over Israel, which again, he will do. God's plan for the future includes the fulfillment of this promise that he made to King David. Finally, there is the covenant that God revealed through his prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. We might hear those words and conclude that God has already fulfilled this promise. He has put his instructions deep within us. His name is, is written on our hearts. He is our God and we are his people. He has forgiven our wickedness and does not remember the sins that we confess to him. But has this promise completely been fulfilled? Look again, who are the two parties to this agreement? One is God and the other is the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant promises a spiritual revival for the Jewish people. One that has not yet occurred, but will occur. We can count on it. So let's review. God made a covenant promise to Adam and Eve that humanity would one day reign over creation. He promised Abraham that his seed would fully inhabit the soil that he would provide. He made a promise to David that his descendant would establish a forever throne and become a forever king. And he promised through Jeremiah that there would be a return and a revival of the Jews. Be assured, God is at work and his plans are proceeding at the right pace in the right places and according to his will. What he has said he is going to do, he will do. In the meantime, we need to lay hold of these great and precious promises. They are the governing principles for the unfolding of history.